I'm pulling away from the curb. We all know what that means. It's time for another drive to work. And I'm dropping my kids off at school today. Okay, so today I'm trying something brand spanking new. Um, so one of the things I realize is sometimes I have interesting topics, but they're not enough to fill up a whole like half hour uh, of a drive to work. And so I'm trying something new, what I'm calling a cluster. And what that means is I'm taking a whole bunch of little things that I don't think is enough for its own podcast, but picking things that are thematically connected so that I can do a podcast about a theme. That's the idea. So for the very first uh, cluster podcast, I've chosen food because I I felt like a food cluster sounded like something. So um, today is a food cluster podcast. So what's going to happen is I'm going to talk all about many different things related to magic and food. That is my plan. Hopefully uh, this turns out well and you guys like the clusters and maybe I'll do more of them. Okay, so let me start with food, the mechanic, since that seems like a fine place to start. So um, I know I've talked a little bit about the origin of food, um, but I want to go a little farther back in explaining, giving some more context to where food came from. Um... So one of the things that happened back in um, Shadows Over Innistrad was we were trying to capture this sense of mystery because we were doing, uh, the idea was Jace was the main character and he was solving a mystery. And a big part of the story because of the trope space we were playing in was the idea of mystery. So we wanted to convey mystery through mechanics. Um, After trying a bunch of different things, Um, We ended up doing Investigate, which made Clue tokens. And the idea was that Clue were artifact tokens that had a a value. You could use them. Uh, Now, we had made counters before. We Obviously, we'd made a lot of creature tokens, and we'd made counters that you keep on yourself. Um, But these were a little bit different. These were, A, they were artifact tokens, and B, um, it was they gave you the ability to later use them. You still had to spend mana on them. Um, but it was something that you could use and give you as a resource. Um, and so we made, clue, we made Clue tokens. They were very popular. Um, I'm sure one day we'll, we'll see Clue back. Um, then in, uh, and that was Shadows of Innistrad. Then in um, Cons of Tarkir, was it Cons? No, no, sorry, Ixalan. Then in Ixalan, um, we were playing around with treasure, and the idea was we wanted to have... Um, counters, we, we wanted, uh, we had done, I think, gold before, um, and we were playing in that space, and it was pirate, so we wanted to have treasure, and the idea was, we wanted an artifact token that you could turn into any color mana, um, so that would help you, you know, there was a lot of, um, pirates, for example, had a, a three-color, uh, was a three-color tribe, we wanted to make sure there were some tools to help you if you wanted to play three-color, um, and so unlike gold, which I think had just been a gold counter... I think um, what, it, what we had done with treasure was make it more of a uh, an artifact token. I don't know, actually, it was gold. Maybe gold was a token. Anyway, um, we then stepped it up a little bit and sort of said, okay, things could generate treasure. Um, and I think we might have even had one or two uses where you could use treasure in a way other than what it, you could generate the mana out of it. Um, Anyway, the reason I'm bringing all this up is we've slowly been carving out this space for artifact tokens that have sort of a functional use for them. Um, And so uh, food did not start as food. I mean, it didn't start as an artifact token. Um, I think the earliest version of food was uh, Peter Lee, my strong second on the set, made a card called Baked into a Pie, which was a white card. And it basically was an arrest. The idea was you can't attack, you can't block, you can't use any activated abilities. Why? Because you've been baked into a pie. Uh, And by the way, I've mentioned this before, but um, baked into a pie was not referencing the nursery rhyme, which is what a lot of people think it's referencing. But in fact, there is a grim fairy tale where uh, I think the mother kills her son and she bakes him into a pie uh, because the constable shows up. Anyway, um... We were referencing a little, little more of a deeper cut, um, referencing another grim fairy tale, uh, a little grimmer of a grim fairy tale. And um, so the idea of the fire originally was it was an arrest, but your opponent gained the ability 
or what, what the enchanted creatures own, um, uh, control are. Gain the ability, sacrifice this creature, gain, I think it was two life. Um, but the idea was, I've turned you into a pie, your creature is no longer useful as the creature. You can't block, attack, you can't block, you can't use your activated abilities. But, but, it's a pie! If you get hungry, you can eat the pie. Um, and so the idea there was, um, and I think the thing that um, Peter was playing into is the idea, which made a lot of sense, was the idea of food equating to health. Um, if you played any video games, you know, elf needs food badly. Um, that there's a long history of food being something that re- re- restores your health in video games. And so it seemed to make a lot of sense. Well, why would I want food? Well, I would eat it for nutrition. Well, what does that mean in gameplay? Oh, well, probably helps your life total because, you know, in real life, eating is what keeps you healthy. Um, so the, then what happened was, so when we turned over from vision, there was just the one singular card. Um, but I think in vision design, it started to dawn on them how many fairy tales had food in them. I mean, a lot, a, a lot. You know, Little Red Riding Hood was taking a basket of goodies to her grandma. Uh, Hansel and Gretel were dropping breadcrumbs to make sure they find their way, but they were so hungry, and then they find a gin- gin- uh, house made of gingerbread that they start eating. Um, you know, the uh, even like the, uh, the big bad wolf seemed very motivated by eating. He wanted to eat, uh, you know, Little Red Riding Hood and her grandmother, or wanted to eat uh, the three little pigs. Um, you have like uh, in Snow White, you have the poisoned apple. You know, anyway, there's a, there's just a lot of things that popped up. You know, the Jack and trading his cow for beans. You know, there's just a lot of food that popped up. Um, and so what we decided to do, or set design decided to do, this after I handed off the set, um, was to make food tokens. And they spent a little bit of time. I mean, they knew they wanted them to be a life gain thing. They knew they wanted them to work like clues, in that you spent some amount of mana and you got some amount of life. Um, I think. I think the earliest version might have been the three life. I mean, I think they, I don't know how much fiddling they did. Uh, I mean, it ended up being uh, two sack to get three life. I think that's what they put. The reason I think they went with three life was they wanted it to be substantial enough that it meant something. Like just getting small incrementals of life uh, just in, in a vacuum by itself is not quite as useful. You know, like if it was one mana get one life. Eh, that, that, you know, you want, you'd rather spend a little bit more mana and get a little bit more life, so they did that. Um, and then once we realized, you know, once set design put food in, there just was lots of fun opportunities to um, do top-down stuff with food. Um, the other thing they did is something that I think we'd done a little bit with treasure and hadn't done at all with clues, was the idea of, okay, we have something, you can trade it for life, but hey, maybe you want something else other than life. And so in black and green, they wove in this flavor of, that was kind of the food deck, um, here are other cards that let you use food in other ways to give you other utility with food. You can sacrifice it to the, the big bad wolf so he can get bigger and become indestructible for the turn. Um, you know, the evil queen can use it to make the opponent lose life rather than you gain life. Um, there's just a whole bunch of different ways. You can trade in with the magic beans, trade in a bunch of food to make a giant. You know, there's a lot of cool and flavorful ways to use it. Um, so anyway, uh, so the big question now is, now that we've made food and food is a thing, will we use food again? Uh, and my guess is because it's so general, like the flavor is so open-ended, food's pretty basic, and it's very straightforward, the idea that I get something that I can trade it in for life, you know, that, that is pretty flexible it doesn't tie too closely, like, well, is it easy, from a flavor standpoint, how many worlds have food? Oh, all of them. And from a mechanic standpoint, how complex is it and how much can it tie into what the set is doing? Well, life always matters. Life's the win condition. So, you know, I think we position food in a place where it'd be very easy for us to make use of it. Oh, another thing we did with food that was unique to food, um, but I, I think it's a, a harbinger of things to come, was that uh, on the low rarities, we tend to tell you what food tokens do, but on the higher rarities, we were willing to just say it's a food token, and then the food token itself tells you what it does. And so I think we're more willing, especially higher rarities, to just say, oh, well, hey, if you sacrifice a food, blah, 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 and then what's a food? Well, go look at the food token, and the food token will tell you, where we just sort of identify it and then make you, the, the, the counter, the token can act, you know, because we make, we make a printed uh, token, can act as sort of the rule support for what the card does. Okay. Next. 
Okay, so one of the questions uh, you might ask is, are there any magic collectibles that are food? And the answer, I believe, is yes, there are three. So I'm going to talk about them. Um, one of them was commercially available. One of them was available at a particular magic event. And one of them was only available to Wizards employees. So let's walk through those. Okay, first was the one that was available to anybody. Um, there's a local company in Seattle called Mother Jones Soda. And they make different flavored sodas. Um, but one of the things that they do is they make a lot of limited run editions of things. And so we did a special thing with them. I think, I think we've done it twice. Where they made, in each case, I think they made five different sodas. One to represent each color of magic. And then um, I think white was clear. Uh, blue was blue. Black, I think, was purple. Uh, it's hard to do black liquids or do black liquids people want to actually drink. Uh, red was red, green was green. Um, and they had the, associ- the uh, accompanying Planeswalker, I think. At least the first time we did it, they had a company Planeswalker. So it, I think it was the Lorwyn 5 at the time. So uh, white was a Johnny, uh, blue was Jace, black was Liliana, red was Chandra, green was Garrick. Um, and anyway, they sold them for a limited amount of time. I actually have one of my desk. I think I have the green one, I have the Garrick one. Um, but anyway, something that people could collect, and I, I know they're out there and they exist. Um, I mean, they're sealed, so I think they're. I think you probably could open one and still drink it. I mean, they're they're you know they're sealed. Um, but anyway, that was something. I, now I don't know if Mother Jones. I know they sell in Seattle. I don't know if they have much how much business they do outside of Seattle. So as, as far as magic collectibles go, I don't know how easy this one was to get. Um, but it definitely exists. I also. Um, I'm willing, I, I, technically I understand that they're not, it's not food, it's a drink. Um, but for my food clusters, I decided I will allow drinks. The drinks are food adjacent. And so um, I'm already trying to stretch uh, a full thing of minutes in here. Um, but anyway, so the Mother Jones Soda was the one that was publicly available. Okay, now, what was the one that was at a magic event? Um, so a while back, um, we, uh, at Friday Night Magic, we like to occasionally just do fun things, do surprises that people aren't expecting. And somebody one day realized um, that M&Ms have on them an M, because they're M&Ms, so they have a little M on them. And someone said, oh, wouldn't it be fun if we put the Magic M, and this is back, uh, back this is under the, our old logo, so the Magic M, the old, the, what was it called, Gaudi, the... I forget the name of the old font. The font that's on the back of the magic card. That M. So we thought it'd be fun to put that M on M&M's and then have the five colors of magic. Um, and I don't know. I, th- I assume we contacted them. Maybe they contacted us. I don't know. But we ended up doing a deal with M&M and we made special magic M&M's um, which we gave away at F&M. So we, inside the building, referred to them as f and m ms uh, And so the f and m ms uh, there were five colors in them the five colors of magic, so white, blue, black, red, green. Uh, and then instead of a, the normal M, they had the magic M on them. Um, and we gave them away. Uh, it was a surprise, and we did it. It was many years ago. I actually still have some sealed f and ms I just sort of saved them as a souvenir. I, I, I would not eat them anymore. Um, but anyway, uh, so that is a candy, a piece of candy. Uh, uh, and and uh, M&Ms. So there, there are magic-branded M&Ms that existed one time. Okay, but third thing uh, was uh, given away. So employees, every December, uh, we get a little holiday, I don't know, I don't know what the right word is, but a little holiday box, or a little gift um, from the company. And usually that includes, most of our products make a um, holiday themed item that we give away to employees and give away to partners we work with. Magic, for example, has what we call the holiday card. We make it every year. It's a silver bordered card. It has some sort, usually it's a pun name or something. Um, let's see if I can remember that. So we had Fruitcake Elemental. Then we had uh, Gifts Ungiven. Then we had uh, Evil Presence. Then we had um, uh, ba, 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 was it Seasons Beatings? Or was it um, Snow... Um, Snow Mercy. I think it was Seasons Beatings, then Snow Mercy. Then we had Yule Ooze. Then we had um, Naughty and Nice, which was a split card. Uh, then we had uh, Mishra's Toy 
Factory, uh, Thopter, Pi Network. I'm playing, okay. I'm, I'm, ironically, I remember the old ones better than the new ones. But anyway, we have like 11 of them. Um, anyway, we give those away every year. Um, and usually, like sometimes D&D will do something or Dual Masters will do something. Um, but also sometimes they'll make just cute little themed things to give us. And one year, they made Mox Chocolate. And what Mox Chocolate was, was a piece of chocolate that was designed to look like a Mox. And it was, on it, it said Mox Chocolate. Um, I, don't th- I don't think I saved that one. I think I might have eaten that one. Um, but anyway, that's another... Now, that item's even harder to collect because only employees got it. Um, but anyway, so Mother Jones Soda, f and and ms and Mox Chocolate are uh, three different magic food-slash-drink collectibles. Um, so there's a trivia question. You guys want to answer a trivia question. Um, oh, oh, okay. Um, I mentioned Yul Ooze, so maybe I should segue into Yul Ooze. So, um, so Fruitcake Elemental, Yul Ooze, is there any other, uh, are those that were food? Um... Those are the ones that jumped. Uh, Thopter Pie Network. Um, so we've had a number of uh, of foods. Um, oh, actually, I didn't. Uh, let's see if I uh, if I have somewhere. Uh, so we um, one of the big questions is what magic cards are are food related, uh, and we've had a, a, a few of them. So let me run through them. Um, so Yule Ooze was one of the holiday cards. Um, so it was a uh, two red green. It was a creature. It was an ooze, one one. At the beginning of your upkeep, destroy another non-land permanent chosen at random. Then put a number of plus one plus one counters on Yule Ooze equal to that permanent's converted mana cost. And then for uh, red and green, eat some food, regenerate Yule Ooze. Um, so. Um, uh, this card, the, normally when we make the holiday cards, we tend to make them based on their name. Like we start with their name. And I think Yule Ooze, which sounds like you lose, obviously, um, was something that Mark Gottlieb would come up with. Like We had the name for years. Um, but we kind of knew we wanted to do it as a red-green card. Um, and we, were, we started by doing a cycle of monocolor cards. So we knew we needed to finish the monocolor cards. So once we did the five monocolor cards, the sixth year we decided to do a gold card, which was Yule Ooze, uh, and we did that. Um, now it's interesting that Yule Ooze, um, until you get to the activated ability, everything, the, the random destroy creature and it grows equal to CMC, Black Border could do all of that. It's, it's a little a little random for, for uh, Black Border, but I mean, the Black Border rules can handle just fine. Um, so we added on the eat some food uh, to regenerate as an additive thing to give it um, a little silver border. Now, speaking of which, speaking of eating food, um, Yule Ooze was actually inspired by a card called Fat Ass. So Fat Ass was a card from Unhinged. Um, the brand team had asked me if I could make the humor a little bit more sophomoric, believe it or not. And so I decided to do Donkey Folk, which all had ass in their name because an ass is a donkey. Um, and so I made a cycle of ass creatures so white was cheap ass, blue was smart ass, black was badass, red was dumb ass, and green was fat ass. So I, the card was a top-down card called fat ass. So, okay, so fat ass is four and a green. It's a creature, a donkey shaman, two, three and a half. So its toughness is three and a half. Fat ass gets plus two, plus two, and gains trample as long as you're eating. Okay, so let me, let me go through a couple things. First off, the reason it has fractions in its power or toughness, in this case toughness, is that all the donkey folk had um, fractions. It was one of the themes of the set. And it just made the donkeys have a little bit of identity. I made all the donkeys have either power or toughness that had a, um, a fraction in it. And by fraction, I mean a half. That's a fraction we had unhinged. Um, this particular one was a donkey shaman. I think they were all donkey, because that was their race, they were donkey folk. And then some, some class, and this one was a shaman. Um, so the idea was I wanted you to eat, um, but the, the premise here was, the idea was in order to play fat ass, you kind of got to be constantly eating was the idea. That was the joke. Um, and the way it works is that when you eat, um, he only gains, the fat ass only gains the bonus while you're eating. 
So you have to be careful when playing fat ass that once you get into combat, meaning once it matters that you have plus two, plus two, you need to keep eating till the end of the turn because if you stop eating, it'll lose the bonus and it'll die. I've watched a lot of people like crunch, 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 attack, they block, and then they stop eating before the turn ends. And it's like, wah, wah. Sorry, it loses its plus two, plus two. Um, I've made a whole bunch of rulings on fat ass. Probably the most uh, famous ruling was is gum food. So one of the things that happens is I have to write the FAQ for uh, all the unsets. And so I have to answer the questions about, okay, well, how does this work? And what would it, what would it do and such? Um, so is gum food came up. So there's a bulletin board that we had, we used to have in our R&D where we'd write questions. And so I asked, is food, is gum food? And I got all sorts of answers. In the end, I ruled the gum wasn't food. It doesn't have particularly any nutritional value to it. And, um, it really, like technically speaking, I, I sort of dived into it and discovered that it wasn't really food. It doesn't, uh, meet the n- nutritional requirements that has the food have. And just saying to play fattest, all you got to do is chew gum felt like a cop out. But the whole point is that you're constantly eating with it. So I ruled no food is not gum is not food. So that was the official fat ass ruling. Um, Dawn on me, by the way, I wrote down Yule Ooze. I did not write down Thopter Pie Network, nor did I write down um, Fruitcake Element. I guess Thopter Pie Network is Thopters delivering pies. So I guess there's a pie th- theme there, so it's food related. Although the, the card itself is not food. Um, although I guess Yule Ooze. I guess Yule Ooze isn't food. It just makes you eat. So it makes you eat food. So it, it references food on the card. Um, I would guess that uh, that uh, Fruitcake Elemental, I mean, whether you consider Fruitcake food, I guess there's that argument. Um, I don't remember exactly. It's a green creature that you keep passing back and forth between you and your opponent. It was the very first card we ever made. In fact, um, the goal of the holiday cards was they were silver bordered and... Um, Fruitcake Elemental is definitely one of the ones where uh, the whole card mechanically could be black bordered. Um, to make it work, you need to flavor it as a fruitcake elemental, and I don't think we would do that in black border. So it's one of those silver border cards that, like, only with the proper flavor does it make sense mechanically as a top down card, and that flavor we would never do in black border. So I don't know, it's loosely a silver border card. Okay, there is one other card I wrote down here that clearly is a magic card that clearly represents a kind of food, which is hot soup. So hot soup is an artifact. costs one, one generic mana. Uh, it is equipment. Equipped creature can't be blocked. Whenever equipped creature is dealt damage, destroy it and equip three. So hot soup was designed by a man named um, James Ernest. So James Ernest was somebody who, when I first came to Wizards, worked at Wizards. Uh, he did not work in R&D. Um, but James, is, his, his great quest was to work in R&D. Uh, he ended up never working in R&D at Wizards. Uh, but when he left Wizards, he later started his own company, Cheap Ass Games. Um, the whole premise of their thing is that they sell you the games as cheap as possible, and they don't include things like dice and markers and things. The idea is, yeah, you have those in other games. Go get those. Uh, and then the, the, the games are as cheap as they can be. Um, James really, really likes to make super flavorful top-down games. Probably one of his most famous was, uh, I think it's called Kill Dr. Lucky, where it's the game of Clue, except instead of trying to figure out who killed Mr. Body, you are trying to kill, I mean, in this case, it's Dr. Lucky. But um, So instead of trying to solve the mystery, to, to who murdered this person, you're trying to be the one that kills them. So it's kind of like a reverse Clue. Um, anyway... Uh, James, uh, when he first worked at Wizards, managed to illustrate a magic card, a card called Reality Warp, I think it is. Reality Warp? It's not a Reality Twist or Reality Warp. It's in, it's in Legends. Um, anyway, so he did, he did illustrate a card, which I'll bring up in a second. Uh, and then years later, during, uh, 2015, we did a promotion where we had, uh, game designers that weren't magic designers, but game designers design magic cards. And um, James did one, and George Fan did one, and Stolen LeBron did one, and um, what's his name who uh, made Minecraft? Uh, ah, I'm looking at his name. Uh, he made one. Anyway, we had a whole bunch of people made one. There's a lot of people that made, that made cards. And um, uh, anyway, James turned in Hot Soup. And Hot Soup, which is a very James kind of card, is super flavorful. 
you're carrying a giant bowl of hot soup, so no one wants to block you because they don't want the hot soup to spill on them. Oh, but if you ever take if anything ever happens to you, it spills on you and then uh, burns you and you die. Um, and so, when it was first turned in, I, I think we are more willing to do silly things than we were at the time this got made. I know the creative team was a little skeptical about it because it wasn't something that we at the time would have done. But the idea was we had guest artists. James is known for doing really flavorful top-down design stuff, and so we left it in. And so Hot Soup made it into the set. Um, and uh, so the, the interesting thing I brought about uh, him doing art is uh, there are not a lot of mag- uh, sorry, a lot of people that have both designed a magic card and done a magic illustration. Although, depending how you count, um, depending how you count the uh, the cards in the um, mystery booster, that that number is about to go way way up. Um, but it, 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 counting sort of official, you know, um, official cards, not not the playtest cards. Um, uh, I had done obviously look at me uh, look at me on the DCI. Yes, Premier Force had designed cards that, uh, and illustrated cards. He even he and I had the honor of having illustrated the card we also designed because L's a Deep Shadow he illustrated and designed. Um, Macavada has illustrated cards and designed cards. James Arnold I believe is, is uh, he, he does our our frames and he and he's an artist so he's done some art. I think Cynthia's designed a card and she's for sure has done art. Um, so anyway, uh, James is on a, a, a small list, or if you contemplate those cards, a slightly bigger list, of, of people who've designed cards and illustrated cards. Um, but anyway, that is... So those are the ones that jump to mind. I'm sure there's a few more food cards that I forgot, but those are the ones that uh, jumped to mind when I thought about it. Okay, next. Um, oh, let's talk a little bit about... Um, so Magic had a birthday... Um, so one of my favorite um, food memories was Hascon. So uh, Hasbro had a convention called Hascon. It was in Rhode Island. Uh, so far there's been one. There's talk of other ones happening, but another one hasn't happened yet. Uh, so the idea of Hascon was we brought together all of Hasbro's different games and all in one place. So there was Nerf. There was My Little Pony. There was Transformers. There, you know. Hasbro had lots and lots of properties. So uh, Magic was at the event, and it turned out that it coincided with the beginning of our celebration of our 25th anniversary. Um, and so it was the very first place we did any celebrating. Uh, so we had a special party at Hascon, and we did this cool thing where we made five cakes, one of each color of Magic, and each cake was a different kind of cake. Now, I did a podcast on Hascon, and because it was right in the moment, I talked to all of the cakes and I remembered exactly what they were. So I, um, I know the red was a red velvet cake. Um, I think the white was an angel food cake. Um, and I think the black was a devil's food cake that was um, dyed so that it was dark. So it, it, it oh, it might, it might actually, might, it might have just been chocolate. It might have been a chocolate devil's food cake and it was just a very rich dark chocolate. So it, it, it red is black. Um, the blue and the green cakes were dyed. Um, I'm trying to remember what kind of cakes they were. Um, the blue was my favorite cake. I think the blue was the, the blue was my of the five cakes my favorite. Um, I really like a, a vanilla cake, and it was a it was a vanilla cake dyed blue. Um, anyway, so it was that's one of the things I remember of as far as like. Um, now, if you went, uh, we did have a bunch of, I think there were four conventions that we had that were birthday conventions. I went to the one in Las Vegas, but there was, there was one, I don't remember exactly, there was one in Japan that, that they made cutouts of me that you could push a button and hear me speak in English or Japanese. Um, there was one in Europe, and there was one, I believe, in South America. I think there were four of them on four different continents. Um, and at those... Well, I know they did this at the Las Vegas one. I, 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 I don't 100% know they did the other ones. But I think each one of them had birthday cupcakes. I know for sure the Las Vegas did. I think they all did. Um, they, because each one was probably done locally, how exactly they were, what they looked like, might have varied a little bit. But in Las Vegas, we had... Um, and I don't know if the different flavors... There, there were five different colors of cupcakes. My gut was that I think they were all... Well, maybe, maybe some were chocolate, some were... Yeah, I think some were chocolate and some were white. But I think the way it worked was 
Uh, we had white ones of all five colors and we have chocolate ones of all five colors. So I think when you went to get your birthday cupcake, you could get vanilla or chocolate and then it, it, they were frosted um, of all the five colors. And I think, now are they frosted, I think they had the mana symbol on top, if I remember correctly. Um, I think. They were really nicely done and they were actually very tasty. So um, if you happen to go any of the birthday things, you could have gotten yourself some birthday cake. Okay. Next. Let's talk a little bit about uh, a weekly R&D tradition that involves food, which is the R&D Tuesday lunch, um, which now we might call the Studio X Tuesday lunch. So for those, those that don't know, um, internally, we repositioned how the company works. And so we became project-based, meaning um, before it was um, by de- the departments were by what you did. So like R&D was its own department. Um, but now, instead of being based on like kind of what you do, uh, it's what you work on. And so now there is a tabletop magic team. There is a magic online team. There's a magic the gathering arena team. Um, there's a franchise team. There's different teams that work on different aspects of things and they're responsible for that product. And then we work together to make sure that there's overlap and synergy between what we do. Um, and the former team that sort of was known as R&D became part of a larger thing that is now, right now, we don't have a real name yet. We're calling ourselves Studio X till we come up with an actual name. Um, we still outside the building, we refer to ourselves as R&D just because it is confusing to the public to constantly be changing terminology. But if you ever hear us refer to Studio X, that is what's going on. Um, Studio X is sort of what was R&D. And, and sometimes if I want to refer to that group external to the larger group, I might refer to R&D, even though we don't use that internally, I guess. Um, and then the, the, uh, more people who work on the uh, who work on magic, including you know people who do packaging and graphic design and the brand work and marketing, and you know the the team is now just much bigger rather than before, where marketing would be its own team and you know R and D was its own team. So anyway, it's a it's a change. I think it's for the better. I think it's allowing us to do cooler things, and um, it is definitely allow us, for example, on tabletop to really dig in there. And I mean, if you notice, we're not we're not sitting by twirling our thumbs we're really trying to improve the product and make cool new things and so anyway there's lots of cool things coming your way some of which you know about some of which you don't um anyway um on tuesdays in studio x um we have what we we call r&d r&d tuesday lunch uh, or maybe now it's studio x uh tuesday lunch so the way it works is we um one of the things that came up was we play a lot of magic but a lot of magic we play is the magic we're working on. So for example, I play lots and lots of magic. All the magic I play is on playtest stickers, or I mean, mostly it's on playtest stickers because I'm playing exploratory design playtests and vision playtests. And I'm, I'm playing magic at a, in a much more proto state than you guys play it because I'm, I'm testing very early stuff out. Um, so one of the things we realized is we'd like to make sure that we had time to play magic as you all play it, the finished project, the finished product version of magic. So on Tuesdays, we have Tuesday lunch. We uh, cater lunch in. We bring lunch in. um, And we we vary it up. You know, one day, one week it's pizza. Then it's Chinese. Then it's Greek. Then it's Thai. Then it's uh, breakfast for lunch and various things. And then we play. um, We will shake up what we play. We play most of the time we play Magic. Um, Every once in a while, we might might play, um, uh, for example... um, we might play, uh, am I blanking on the name? Um, we make another trading card game. Uh, and I just, I just said their names. Um, Transformers. So every once in a while we'll do Transformers for lunch. I think we might have once done Duel Masters, although Duel Masters is only in Japanese. So it's, it's a little trickier to play with Duel Masters. Um, but anyway, most of the time we play Magic. And usually it is the latest Magic. So that, you know, like, you know, Throne of Eldraine. We'll play Throne of Eldraine. And the idea is just get us more... Um, more experience playing with the finished final product just so because we interact with all of you and you guys that that's that's the magic that you play right that that's kind of the official magic that's what magic is and we want to make sure that we have enough time playing with the finished product so on tuesdays we have lunch and we play with the finished product um sometimes by the way every once in a while we'll bring in something special like one week we we played with japanese war of the spark for example because that had the promotion it with the planeswalkers and it was really fun because 
everything was in Japanese, and so it is it is tricky playing a game. Even you know, like I have played a lot of War of the Spark. I haven't played a lot of War of the Spark with the final product, and I'm not used to the art. You know, I've not played a lot with the art, so it was definitely a challenge for me to remember what all the cards were and stuff. I mean, I was able to do it, but uh, it definitely was a challenge. And um, I know, very, very, like I know, I, I was involved in this, but like they sometimes they'll do advanced stuff and they want to test stuff. Uh, like the, I know the mystery booster got drafted one lunch. Um, anyway, but it is a chance for us to play with a lot of whatever's out now, and um, it's a lot of fun, and it, it, it's a big part of uh, R and D slash Studio X culture. Okay, next. Um, okay, so this is a little bit of. Um, I'm not sure if this counts as magic, uh, but I thought I would share with you. So I am a sucker for traditions. Uh, if anyone's heard about my birthday dinner, every, like every birthday, for example, I, I have crab legs on my birthday. And I, 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 my birthday party is always a seafood restaurant, and I have crab legs. So, for example, um, if you've ever seen me, when I, whenever I talk about my birthday, I usually show pictures. And um, as is tradition at my birthday, uh, it always has a superhero theme using uh, usually children's decorations. So the, the people serving on us always think it's my son's birthday. Um, and usually it's tied to whatever the movie's coming out that summer just to make it easy to get decorations. Um, but anyway, um, so like every year, for example, I will have crab legs on my birthday. Um, there's two other things that I do that are food-related that I do every year that are tied to holidays. Um, and I do, that, I do it at work. Um, one is on Valentine's Day. On Valentine's Day, I always hand out little tiny conversation hearts uh, those are the little hearts that say things on them, like "love you" or you know, "be mine" or whatever. Um, I th- uh, all of these traditions go back to me being a kid. Um, in fact, all of them go back to me being under ten. Uh, the, the, all three, I think, the, the crap legs and the Valentine's and the Halloween stuff I'm going to talk about are all go back to me being pretty little. Um, and I just I like tradition. I'm a big I'm, I'm a big stickler for for just doing things that I've always done and. Um, anyway, so every Valentine's Day, I, I hand out little, I, I put little bowls of conversation hearts out for people to eat. Um, I think once upon a time I used to do the little chalky ones, but then I learned that Sweet Tart made conversation hearts. And I'm a big fan of Sweet Tarts. Especially as a kid, I was a big fan of Sweet Tarts. So I, I, I switched over to Sweet Tart conversation hearts when Sweet Tart hearts were a thing. Um, and anyway, I, every Valentine's Day, I will hand those out. Uh, and then every uh, Halloween... Um, so if you guys have ever had candy corn, technically candy corn is made out of what they call mellow cream. It's the, I don't know the name they call it. Um, and they make, uh, pumpkins out of that material. So, uh, they're orange pumpkins and then they put a little, they color the top green to look like the leaves of a pumpkin. Uh, and they call those mellow cream pumpkins. And mellow cream pumpkins are only put out, uh, in the fall, usually around, um, Halloween. Anyway, I always give up mellow cream pumpkins. Uh, on Halloween. So on um, Valentine's Day, I always give a little conversation hearts. And on Halloween, I always give up mellow cream pumpkins. And I've been doing that for quite a while. Oh, one other tradition that started in R&D is I give away a lot of candy in my house every year. I give away a, a huge amount of candy. Um, but my, the, in my house, the tradition is we fill up this giant... When I say giant bucket, I mean um, a pail. It's, not, it's a giant pail. It is two feet high and multiple feet across and it's a giant pail and in my house when you come to trick or treat um, you are allowed to grab as much candy as you can grab with one hand without scooping overhand like like, like the claw um, and so I normally buy a huge amount of candy a, a good mix a, a, a nice mix of candy um, and uh, usually because I buy so much candy there's some leftovers at the end of the year and then as the holidays happen you know, Christmas and Hanukkah and Easter and Valentine's Day. Um, we'll get my kids candy and eh, not all of it goes eaten. Um, and so we slowly over the course of the year build up this candy residue. Uh, and then come Halloween, I need to get rid of the candy so I can fill up the bucket to um, do that year's Halloween. And many years ago, I asked r and I said, look, I have this excess candy. Some of it's old. Some of it's as old as last Halloween. Some of it's newer because it could be anywhere within the last year. It might have been from my birthday. It might have been from Easter. It might have been from Christmas. It's from all during the year. Um, I'm going to throw it out. But if you guys want it, I'll bring it in. And they said, bring it in. 
So every year, right before Halloween's about to begin, I bring in bowls of my um, candy, which, which I, I mark, I identify as being the, from the Rosewater Candy Bowl, and then I explain that it could be up to a year old. Um, and there's a few candies you've, they sort of learn not to eat out of the bowl. Some of them I don't even put in the bowl, like uh, Twizzlers don't last a year, so I will throw the Twizzlers out. But anyway, um, every year I bring in the, the Rosewater Candy Bowl for R&D to eat during the month of October. So that, that is another tradition. So there's a bunch a bunch of food traditions. Like I said, I don't know how magic he is. It's more me than me. But I, it's my podcast, so I will... Sh- and, and I needed to fill up the time. So there was, there, there was a limited amount of magic food-related things I could find. Okay, so I'm almost to work. Let me see if I've forgotten anything else. Um, I, I, I wrote down a, a list of things. Um, there's a lot of little things I wrote down here. Um, like... Uh, Back in the day at the Pro Tour, there used to be a period of time where we used to do a, a, a plate or dinner. We eventually phased that out many, many years ago. But um, we would do the plate or dinner, and that would always be the night before the first day. Uh, and then we, we would shake up what kind of dinners we, we would do. Uh, that was something uh, that we used to do. Um, and then I think, oh, we still do it now. Um, I believe we still do it now. Uh, every year on the Hall of Fame, um, we invite all the new inductees uh, and then often some of, some of the hall of fa- existing Hall of Famers um, to a dinner. We have official sort of Hall of Fame dinner every year. That's like a, a little a little thing. Um, I think that's it. Um, I think I covered all the different things I'd written down. So hopefully, anyway. So the, one of the big questions is: Do you guys like this cluster idea? It is me talking about a lot of little things and you know stuff that might not have room or space. Like, I'm not sure when I would talk about the F and M and M's, but having a food one lets me do that. So anyway, I'd like to hear from you. Did you like this? Would you like more cluster podcasts? If you would, let me know. If you don't, let, also let me know. But anyway, I'm now at work. So we all know that means means instead of uh, talking magic, it's time. Oh, that means at the end of my drive to work. Instead of talking magic, it's time for me to be making magic. I'll see you guys next time. Bye bye. <laughs>